Letter three of Letters from Egypt by Lady Lucy Duff Gordon. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. To Mrs. Austin, Grand Cairo, Tuesday, November eleventh, eighteen sixty two. Dearest Mutter, I write to you out of the real Arabian Nights. Well may the Prophet, whose name be exalted, smile when he looks on Cairo. It is a golden existence, all sunshine and poetry, and, I must add, kindness and civility. I came up last Thursday by railway with the American Consul General, a charming person, and had to stay at this horrid Shepherd's Hotel. But I do little but sleep here. Hekekian Bey, a learned old Armenian, takes care of me every day, and the American Vice-Consul is my sacrifice. I went on Sunday to his child's christening, and heard Sakna, the restorer of hearts. She is wonderfully like Rachel, and her singing is hundrizened from expression and passion. Mr. Wilkinson, the consul, is a Levantine, and his wife Armenian. So they had a grand fantasia. People feasted all over the house and in the street. Arab music shemtert, women yelled the zagarit, black servants served sweetmeats, pipes, and coffee, and behaved as if they belonged to the company, and I was strongly under the impression that I was at Nuruddin's wedding with the vizier's daughter. Yesterday I went to Heliopolis with Hekekian Bey and his wife, and visited an Armenian country lady close by. My servant Omar turns out to be a jewel. He has deterré an excellent boat for the Nile voyage, and I am to be mistress of a captain, a mate, eight men, and a cabin boy for twenty-five pounds a month. I went to Bulak, the port of Cairo, and saw various boats, and admired the way in which the English travellers pay for their insolence and caprices. Similar boats cost people with dragomans fifty pounds to sixty-five pounds. But then, I shall lick the fellows, etc., is what I hear all round. The dragoman, I conclude, pockets the difference. The owner of the boat, Sik Ahmed el Berberi, asked thirty pounds, whereupon I touched my breast, mouth, and eyes, and stated through Armar that I was not, like the other Ingles, made of money, but I would give twenty pounds. He then showed another boat at twenty pounds, very much worse, and I departed, with fresh civilities, and looked at others, and saw two more for twenty pounds, but neither was clean, and neither had a little boat for landing. Meanwhile Sid Ahmed came after me and explained that, if I was not like other Ingles in money, I likewise differed in politeness, and had refrained from abuse, etc., etc., and I should have the boat for twenty-five pounds. It was so very excellent in all fittings, and so much larger, that I thought it would make a great difference in health. So I said if he would go before the American vice-consul, who is looked upon as a sharp hand, and would promise all he said to me before him, it should be well." Mr. Thayer, the American consul-general, gives me letters to every consular agent depending on him, and two Coptic merchants whom I met at the Fantasia have already begged me to honour their houses. I rather think the poor agents, who are all Armenians and Copts, will think I am the Republic in person. The weather has been all this time like a splendid English August, and I hope I shall get rid of my cough in time, but it has been very bad." There is no cold at night here as at the Cape, but it is nothing like so clear and bright. Omar took Sally sightseeing all day while I was away, into several mosques. In one he begged her to wait a minute while he said a prayer. They compare notes about their respective countries, and are great friends, but he is put out at my not having provided her with a husband long ago, as is one's duty towards a female servant, which almost always here means a slave." Of all the falsehoods I have heard about the East, that about women being old hags at thirty is the biggest. Among the poor fellow-women it may be true enough, but not nearly as much as in Germany, and I have now seen a considerable number of Levantine ladies looking very handsome, or at least comely, till fifty. Sakna, the Arab grisly, is fifty-five, an ugly face, I am told, she was veiled, and one only saw the eyes and glimpses of her mouth when she drank water, but the figure of a leopard, all grace and beauty, and a splendid voice of its kind, harsh but thrilling, like Malibran's. I guessed her about thirty, or perhaps thirty-five. When she improvised, the finesse and grace of her whole vessin were ravishing. 
I was on the point of shouting out Wallah as heartily as the natives. The eight younger Halma, i.e., learned women, which the English call Alma and think is an improper word, were ugly and screeched. Sakna was treated with great consideration, and quite as a friend by the Armenian ladies with whom she talked between her songs. She is a Muslim and very rich and charitable. She gets fifty pounds for a night's singing at least. It would be very easy to learn colloquial Arabic, as they all speak with such perfect distinctness that one can follow the sentences and catch the words one knows as they are repeated. I think I know forty or fifty words already, besides my salam alaikum and bakshish. The reverse of the brilliant side of the medal is sad enough. Deserted palaces and crowded hovels scarce good enough for pigsties. One day man see his dinner, and one other day none at all, as Omar observes. And the children are all shocking from bad food, dirt, and overwork, but the little pot bellied, blear eyed wretches grow up into noble young men and women under all their difficulties. The faces are sad and rather what the Scotch call dour, not méchant at all, but harsh like their voices. All the melody is in walk and gesture, they are as graceful as cats, and the women have exactly the breasts like pomegranates of their poetry. A tall Bedouin woman came up to us in the field yesterday to shake hands and look at us. She wore a white sackcloth shift and veil, und Viternicht, and asked Mrs. Hakekian a good many questions about me, looked at my face and hands, but took no notice of my rather smart gown which the village women admired so much shook hands again with the air of a princess, wished me health and happiness, and strode off across the graveyard like a stately ghost. She was on a journey all alone, and somehow it looked very solemn and affecting to see her walking away towards the desert in the setting sun like Hagar. All is so scriptural in the country here. Sally called out in the railroad, There is Boaz, sitting in the cornfield, and so it was, and there he has sat for how many thousand years, and Sakna sang just like Miriam in one war-song. Wednesday. My contract was drawn up and signed by the American vice-consul to-day, and my rais kissed my hand in due form, after which I went to the bazaar to buy the needful pots and pans. The transaction lasted an hour. The copper is so much per oka, the workmanship so much, every article is weighed by a sworn weigher and a ticket sent with it. More Arabian Nights. The shopkeeper compares notes with me about numerals, and is as much amused as I. He treats me to coffee and a pipe from a neighboring shop, while Omar eloquently depreciates the goods and offers half the value. A water-seller offers a brass cup of water, I drink, and give the huge sum of twopence, and he distributes the contents of his skin to the crowd, there is always a crowd, in my honor. It seems I have done a pious action. Finally a boy is called to carry the battery de cuisine, while Omar brandishes a gigantic kettle which he has picked up a little bruised for four shillings. The boy has a donkey which I mount astride a la robe, while the boy carries all the copper things on his head. We are a rather grand procession, and quite enjoy the fury of the dragomans and other leeches who hang on the English at such independent proceedings, and Omar gets reviled for spoiling the trade by being cook, dragoman, and all in one. I went this morning with Hakekian Bay to the two earliest mosques. The Tuloon is exquisite, noble, simple, and what ornament there is, is the most delicate lacework and embossing in stone and wood. This Arab architecture is even more lovely than our Gothic. The Tolun is now a vast poorhouse, a nest of paupers. I went into three of their lodgings. Several Turkish families were in a large square room, neatly divided into little partitions, with old mats hung on ropes. In each were as many bits of carpet, mat, and patchwork as the poor owner could collect, and a small chest and a little brick cooking place in one corner of the room, with three earthen pipkins for I don't know how many people. That was all. They possessed no sort of furniture, but all was scrupulously clean and no bad smell whatever. A little boy seized my hand and showed me where he slept, ate and cooked, with the most expressive pantomime. As there were women, Hakekian could not come in, but when I came out an old man told us that they received three loaves, 
cakes as big as a sailor's biscuits, four piastres a month, i.e. eight pence per adult, a suit of clothes a year, and on festive occasions lentil soup. Such is the almshouse here. A little crowd belonging to the house had collected, and I gave sixpence to an old man, who transferred it to the first old man to be divided among them all, ten or twelve people at least, mostly blind or lame. The poverty wrings my heart. We took leave with salams and politeness like the best society, and then turned into an Arab hut stuck against the lovely arches. I stooped low under the door, and several women crowded in. This was still poorer, for there were no mats or rags of carpet, a still worse-looking cooking-place, a sort of dog-kennel piled up of loose stones to sleep in, which contained a small chest and the print of human forms on the stone floor. It was, however, quite free from dust, and perfectly sweet. I gave the young woman who had let me in sixpence, and here the difference between Turk and Arab appeared. The division of this created a perfect storm of noise, and we left the five or six Arab women out shrieking a whole rookery. I ought to say that no one begged at all. FRIDAY. I went to-day on a donkey to a mosque in the bazaar, of what we call Arabesque style, like the Alhambra, very handsome. The Qibla was very beautiful, and as I was admiring it, Omar pulled a lemon out of his breast, and smeared it on the porphyry pillar on one side of the arch, and then entreated me to lick it. It cures all diseases. The old man who showed me the mosque pulled eagerly at my arm to make me perform this absurd ceremony, and I thought I should have been forced to do it. The base of the pillar was clogged with lemon juice. I then went to the tombs of the Khalifa, one of the great ones had such arches and such wondrous cupolas, but all in ruins. There are scores of these noble buildings, any one of which is a treasure, falling to decay. The next, strange to say, was in perfect repair. I got off the donkey, and Omar fidgeted and hesitated a little, and consulted with a woman who had the key. As there were no overshoes, I pulled off my boots, and was rewarded by seeing the footprints of Mohammed on two black stones, and a lovely little mosque, a sort of Saint chapelle Omar prayed with ardent fervor, and went out backwards, saluting the prophet aloud. To my surprise, the woman was highly pleased with sixpence, and did not ask for more. When I remarked this, Omar said that no Frank had ever been inside to his knowledge. A mosque-keeper of the sterner sex would not have let me in. I returned home through endless streets and squares of Muslim tombs, those of the Memluks among them. It was very striking, and it was getting so dark that I thought of Nuruddin Bay, and wondered if a djinn would take me anywhere if I took up my night's lodging in one of the comfortable little cupola-covered buildings. My Coptic friend has just called in to say that his brother expects me at Kenna. I find nothing but civility and a desire to please. My boat is the Zent el Bahrain, and I carry the English flag and a small American distinguishing pennant as a signal to my consular agents. We sail next Wednesday. Good-bye for the present, dearest mutter. End of letter 3 Read by Sibella Denton all LibriVox files are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org.